Um, so I to there was a question concerning the equation um, that requires here the wave equation. So I calculated this for you guys. I, I, I try to uh, show this to you. I hope you can see this now. Um, so you can see, I just wrote it down. This is now on the whiteboard, so to speak, and I scanned it. So here you have uh, you, the advection equation, number one, okay, where T denotes time derivative x, x derivative. You take the x derivative, you have this equation. You take the T derivative of this, and you get this equation. So if equations one, two, three, now you subtract three minus a times two, and you can see you arrive at psi tt minus a squared psi xx equals zero. And this is the wave equation. So you can see the wave equation is nothing which has been added here, but it follows from the advection equation directly. Okay, so it's nothing new here, so it has not been used here, and I thank you for this question, and I uh, rephrase this here, okay, uh, the sentence here, instead of use the wave equation, you now see here, we differentiate it with respect to time and space, and obtain by subtracting them, and obtain the wave equation, which we can then use in the modify equation, okay, I hope this makes things clearer, uh, and um, maybe in some future slides I can update it and so on. So this was just, um, let me see this here, how can I make this here to full screen for you guys, okay? Uh, so you can see I updated it here, uh, and um, so you cannot use it, but you have it directly from your advection equation. So if there's no further questions to these past chapters, I would then move on, and I would first like to jump to skip the waves now and go to the diffusion first, okay? This waves is also interesting, but I go to diffusion first because this will clarify some things about uh, implicit methods and explicit methods and diffusion is if we do numerical astrophysics, if we want to do numerical astrophysics, also one important ingredient and is also covered in this books in methods of astrophysics. Okay, so the background. Some astrophysical background. I don't know how familiar you are with astrophysics in general. Um, if we have the possibility of treating radiative transport in the diffusion limit, that means we are relatively obliquely thick, then we have for the radiative flux F, we have this expression here, which is the great proportional to the gradient of the radiation energy, ER, times some diffusion coefficient here. Okay, this we take now for granted. This follows from astrophysics directly. If we use this relation for the radiation energy density, A times T to the fourth, which we can do if we are obliquely thick and in thermal equilibrium, as you know, then we arrive at this expression for the radiative flux here, okay? Um, so you can see the flux we have, the diffusive flux we have is always proportional to some gradient of the quantity we would like to study. In this case, either the radiation energy uh, equation uh, or the temperature equation. So we can combine now the equations for the radiation energy and the thermal energy using with some relations here, and we would arrive at the evolution equation for the thermal energy here, okay? If we say that the radiation energy density is always much smaller than the thermal energy density, we would have this equation here for the temperature evolution in astrophysics given by some radiative flux here. Okay, and for constant density, specific heats and so on, we can pull this out here of our time derivative here and arrive at this equation here. And here you can clearly see, you have on the left side, you have the first order time derivative of the temperature. And on the second side, we have two times Nabla here. We have a second order spatial derivative of the temperature. And so this is a diffusion equation classic diffusion equation where the diffusion coefficient here uh, can depend 
strongly on the physical parameters, uh, temperature and the density. The opacity and the opacity also depends on temperature and, and density and so on. So it's, a, it's in fact a rather complicated diffusion coefficient here, but it, it remains in the diffusion equation, of course. Okay, so, and now we would like to discretize this equation here and we will have now a different type of, of numerical equation and uh, diffusion equation which needs to be treated differently from the advection part, part that we had before, okay? Um, and I will go now somehow into the details here um, how we solve this, okay? Before doing so, we will have a very simple model equation again uh, for this rather complex diffusion equation here. So the model equation is that we will solve here is the equation 85, okay, which is just here. We assume that all the uh, diffusion coefficient parts are constant now, and we have the classic diffusion equation for the temperature. We, uh, dt over dt is given by k times nabla squared t. So this is exactly the heat evolution we have here, let's say on Earth, if we are in a room there and we want to insulate the room, from coldness here in the winter or hotness in, 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 in Iran, wherever you are. So we uh, need to calculate the change then in the temperature is given by some diffusion coefficients, how fast the heat or the temperature in this case can propagate, can diffuse through some surroundings. So, <clears throat> the unit of K, coincidentally, this is some, some background here, it's identical to the units of the kinematic viscosity in the viscosity equation. And in viscosity is equivalent, of course, to a diffusion process for the momentum equation. So the, mathematically, the equations are entirely identical, only that you have three velocity components, which makes life much more difficult, of course. And here you have just one scalar quantity, like the temperature, for example. But otherwise, uh, viscosity is also treated, I mean, mathematically handled like a diffusion process, of course, and would be identical here. The dimensions is length squared per time, and so it have the, they have the same dimensions here. Nu is the kinematic viscosity coefficient. Okay, here we assume that k is constant, which is a big simplification, but uh, we just do it to illustrate the numerical methods here. And we're going to solve this equation as we have done before, Instead of in, in 3D, we do it in 1D. And we take again our preferred direction, which is the X direction, of course. Okay, so we have from this 3D equation, we write that the 1D equation here, D over dt is constant K times the second partial derivative of the temperature here. Okay, good. We have again the grid. I made it now large enough here. So we have a grid here from x min here to x max, and we have here n grid cells from T1 till Tn. And um, we want to solve the equations in this grid here where x and x min and x max are boundaries. And we need to, we will talk here also about boundary conditions. Because what I didn't point out clearly, maybe the solution that we will get from these differential equations is always a function of the initial conditions that we impose at time t equals zero and the boundary conditions. Boundary conditions are quite often overlooked, um, but they are very important. Okay, in principle, we need two ghost cells on each side, but here we have only one ghost cell decide, uh, imposed here. I should have made also two here. Okay, so we have cells in this grid here which are beyond the actual active domain. The active domain goes from x min to x max here. This is the domain in which we calculate our numerical solution. Convenient, for numerical convenience, we add some ghost cells here, and this is one on each side for the diffusion equation. For the advection equation and others, if you do them in second order, you typically need two ghost cells on each side. Like in this linear advection problem, the project one, you have two ghost cells here and two ghost cells there. So this needs to be kept in mind. But here, 
uh, we need only one gauss cell for this okay so we have an equidistant spacing again so we have a constant good spacing delta x just as before so this is identical to the notation as before okay and we have the same notation here again yeah so tjn is the value of the temperature after the nth time step at the grid point xj okay in two dimensions it would be something like this and you can extend it also to 3d uh, by adding another third let's say index here j k l or something for your spatial index i omit the index i here because i is usually the the um, 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 uh, 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 imaginary number okay good that's this I'm just waiting sometimes so you can adapt and have time to ask questions and so on so and to give my voice a little <clears throat> rest okay so we want to use this equation to 85 now and differentiate it on this grid okay so we write now here for the derivatives on the left hand side i didn't write the original equation here for some reason or the other uh, we have the time derivative we know now how to, to uh, use the time derivative here so it's it's an, it's a forward time derivative here then we have on the left and the right hand side we would have the second order spatial derivative at grid point j okay I wrote it here, it would be T over Tx, T over, yes, yes, there's some D over Dx, there's some T too much here. So this T is too much here, so I drop it, I cannot drop it out now, so this T here is too much. So it's D over Dx, DT over Dx, okay? Um, so you have K here, times in brackets, so we take the first, first we take the deriv spatial derivative of this here, Okay, this would be at grid point J, so it would be D over D, DT over the X at grid point J plus one half, J minus one half over delta X here. This would be the first derivative here. And then we take the second derivative here. Yes. And um, then we have here, I think these slides need to be improved. They may have some errors here, don't worry. And so we take this derivative here again, and then we arrive at this derivative here. Okay. <clears throat> yeah so no it's fine i think so we take yes it's all fine here so only this t is here too much we take here d over dx of this one minus this one over dx and then we take this derivative is this one and this derivative is this one here okay i'm too speaking too fast and the cursor is moving too slow here okay good and then we arrive at this finite difference equation for the temperatures here okay and we see the difference now is, in contrast to our vection part here, we have to divide by a delta x squared, and previously we only had delta x. And this comes because this is a second order derivative, and you can see here this is sy symmetric around the point tj here, okay? So we arrive at the final equation, which is written here. This is our final equation we have and sigma now is the corresponding part for the diffusion uh, equation. It's given by this expression here, k delta t over delta x squared, okay? So as you see here now, we have not given any time level on the right-hand side, okay? So here, we this was our, our time derivative, so we are going from time m to time n plus 1 here, but on the right-hand side, I did not specify the time level here on the right-hand side, okay? And the reason is that we will use different time levels on the right-hand side, and these time levels on the right-hand side distinguish explicit from implicit schemes, okay? And then, because there was a question about those, I thought it would be very useful to go into this now. And as you shall see, for the diffusion equation like this one here and in, in, in for the uh, other diffusion equations in ra radiation transport, it's always advantageous to use implicit schemes, okay, which are much more costly, unfortunately, uh, but they serve uh, as a stability guarantee for these equations here. Okay, we'll describe different schemes in the following, okay.
forward Euler, this is a forward time centered space method. We saw for the advection part that this led to an unstable scheme, but here is it, it is not so. So here we just choose on the right hand side just the old time step. So we do it at each point, we just use time step n so we can ex explicitly calculate the new temperature at all grid points from known variables on the right hand side. This is called an explicit method. You can always calculate the new quantities. They do not depend on the new quantities on the right hand side. Okay, so here we can see the stencil for this method. So we have the time level Tn, want to step to time level Tn plus 1 here, and we are having three grid points here, J, J minus 1, J plus 1, and we combine this here to a new quantity here, T, Tj, uh, N plus 1. Okay, so this is the so-called as I've said before, stencil for this method here. And this is a forward Euler method because we step forward. And Euler, it's, it's because this first order time derivative, as we know it maybe from ordinary dif differential equations, it's called the Euler method. The Euler methods for the time integration. First order Euler methods here, okay. Other runge kutter methods like Hoyne methods or other uh, would be then second order in time. Okay, forward time centered space, perfectly all right method. And it's also stable as, as long as the time step is suitably small, this method is now stable and not unstable as it was for the advection equation, by the way. Good, backward Euler, okay. This, this one was forward Euler, backward Euler means, okay, we again here at time level Tn, want to go to time level Tn plus 1, okay, but now, so the left-hand side is formally the same, but on the right-hand side, we plugged in all new quantities, okay, and that's, that's why we call this, or why it is called, not we, but it is called the scheme here, backward Euler, because we look back, we go from one old time step to three new ones, essentially, um, okay, and this is now called an implicit method because you cannot calculate the new value at grid point J, let's say, from only known values because you have all new values here. And in addition, at different grid points. So there's no way of calculating this directly from the old values. It's, an, it's implicitly hidden in the set of equations uh, and the new values. And this means you have to solve matrix equations. I will come to this. So this is much much more complicated. Yes, and this is only 1D. Yes, and you can imagine in, in, in 2D or 3D, this is rather complicated thingy. Okay, so you have the stencil is just inverted from the other one. This was the forward Euler and this is backward Euler. So it's essentially the same procedure there, but the only difference is we have added now here on the right hand side the quantities at the new time level here. To solve equation 90 now, you have to solve a linear system of equations because all grid points are coupled. Yes, and this is, a, and, and the dimensions of this linear system is just the dimension of your grid. So in this case, capital N would be the dimension of your system of linear equations here. So the matrix that is going in there has the, the uh, size n times n, okay. The third method I would like to discuss is the so-called Crank-Nicholson method, which is very simply the sum of the above two divided by two, okay. So we add the backward Euler here plus forward Euler here divided by two and that's it. And this is also an implicit method because on the right hand side you have also here the new quantities and you have at the same time the old quantities, okay. The Crank-Nicholson method is due to its centering now, you see, the addition of these two methods here at new and old time step makes them centered in time, okay, 
And so you can see here you have the delta t, the difference is delta t, and here the, on the right hand side you are centered in time. So this method is by construction second order in space and time, while the two previous methods were always only first order in time. The Euler uh, derivative is only first order in time, as you may know. And, but this is, ex is explicitly an implicit method, which is second order in space and time. Okay? And the scheme, as I said here, it's centered in T and X, and this means second order. All right. Coupled equations. Okay. It's um, the solution of equation 89. So what is equation 89? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the explicit one was very simple. The explicit one is very simple. Okay, and you just have to update it and you can calculate it, okay? And uh, the only have to take care of that on the right-hand side, the old values are used. So you have to have two grids. If you do it numerically, you have to have two grids, old grid and then updated new grid. And otherwise, you, you override successively the old grid cells, uh, the old values with the new values. So this is a classic mistake that people do. I have done it several times myself, of course but then this is not the right solution. So you have to take, for the, all the grid points, you have to take the old values and not do it su uh, successively. Okay, the other methods, they are the implicit methods, backward Euler or Crank Nicholson, they require uh, to solve a couple systems of linear equations here. And this leads, uh, gives rise to a so-called matrix equation, which in 1D looks like this here. I just wrote it like this. So you have these, this is one single equation for the um, temperature at the grid point Tj at time n plus 1 here. And you have combined j minus 1 and j plus 1 here. Okay. And you have a right-hand side. So it's a classic uh, with some coefficients a, b, and c. They are known. They are known and they, uh, I think I've written them down in the next, let's say, equation here. So you can see this here. From this equation here, you can, you can always combine this here. So this would be uh, Tj n plus 1 you combine with this one here, and these, these two you combine, and so on. And then you can calculate the coefficients a, b, and c for all numbers j here. And you can see that they have this structure here. Okay. Uh, this is for backward Euler uh, center, center time, backward time center space here. And this is this method here, and for Crank Nicholson, they're a little bit more complicated, but they are relatively easily calculated. So you know the coefficients of your matrix in your matrix equation here. And A is here, uh, just sigma, I think, here uh, for, um, in this, on this expression, A is sigma halves here, uh, and which is given by this expression here. Okay, so A, or sigma is again something like the, current number type of thing. Okay. K times delta T over delta X squared. It's dimensionless. So sigma is a dimensionless number in the equations. This needs to be kept in mind. It's a dimensionless number here. So it's once you have calculated the individual coefficients, you can solve the matrix. Solving the matrix then gives you the quantities of the temperature at the new time step. So it's relatively, if you have a matrix solver, let's say, at your, uh, at, your, uh, uh, um, at your hand, then you just, the problem is just in calculating these coefficients from these equations. And this one here is relatively straightforward since you have constant uh, grid here, constant diffusion coefficient, which goes in here. But it's in principle also possible if you are careful enough to do this for a time, let's say for spatially varying diffusion coefficient, and uh, to write it down very uh, carefully uh, uh, for your uh, finite difference equations. Okay, once you have this, you can write it down as a matrix equation, which is, so this is exactly equation, sorry, equation 92 now, written out as a matrix equation. So the matrix looks like this here. You have on the diagonal, you have the B1 to Bn's, this would be the upper triangle here, the, and the lower diagonal, upper diagonal, lower diagonal here. Yes, and then on the right hand, you multiply this by your vector of unknowns, which is T1 n plus 1 up to T n n plus 1. So these are n unknowns here, and you have your right hand sides here. 
and um, you can see this matrix, the dimensions of this matrix here is n times n, okay? So it's an n cross n matrix here. This is in 1D, okay, yes, but imagine in 3D, yes, you have to, uh, it's uh, whatever n x times n y times n z times n x times n y times n z. So it can be a very, very big matrix in 3D. Okay, because you have to multiply each dimensions with each other and then square the whole thing. So there's very, very many entries there. But it's very many entries are zero. So everywhere where these dots are here and this, this matrix here, they're all zeros here. Only there uh, where uh, only on the diagonal and the upper diagonal and the lower diagonal, only there you have non-zero entries. In each line there's only three numbers that are non-zero. Everything else is zero. Okay, this simplifies matters considerably and um, for the solution of this equation you can go by uh, substitution, forwards, uh, uh, um, substitution and backward elimination by the Gaussian. You can just solve it explicitly this equation by subtracting uh, uh, certain multiples of this equation the first one, subtracting it from the second, then go step by step through all this here, and then you go back and solve it. This is explained here. You can do it by, as I said, Gaussian elimination for this time here, or you go to this so-called Thomas algorithm, where you just click on this here, and you go there, and there's even, if you look at this wonderful web page here, Wikipedia, I think it's Wikipedia or something, yes. Indeed, you can find the method here, you can even find the routines, yes. And so it's nowadays, I think, even numerics is done so easily. Uh, yeah. And uh, Okay, so this is uh, the Thomas algorithm here. We do an elimination, as I have said here. You eliminate the uh, sub-diagonal here by this first step here, and you have to subtract always equations from each other here. So we have to modify here bj and rj here, and then you do a backward substitution here, and you go backward and can calculate explicitly all your tn plus 1j from your pre-calculated variables here, okay? And this is given here. So this is, this whole procedure here is an explicit construction which is equivalent to the Thomas algorithm that I've shown you on this web page. So this is a, 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 in, in 1D, it can be done, ex, can be written easily, explicitly, um, the solution there. In multi-dimensions there, you cannot write, uh, let's say, a solver like this directly, but you have to use iterative matrix solvers. There's no way you can calculate these huge matrices you arrive at in multi-dimensional diffusive problems directly but you have to use an iterative matrix solver, as I said. Okay, but this is something more. So, um, boundary conditions. I will say something about boundary conditions here for this diffusion part here. Um, there's different types. This, as I said, this is a second order partial differential equation, and you might remember from electrodynamics or electrostatics also uh, that there's different boundary conditions possible for the rev for the potential, for example, for the electric potential. First of all, you have the so-called Dirichlet boundary conditions, where you fix the values at the boundary. So, the in the ghost cell, which I've pointed out, for example, you can give a minimum temperature there, okay, and for the a maximum temperature on the right-hand side at the boundary, yes, and uh, this would be, let's say, fixed temperature like you have an oven plate, for example, you're cooking some noodles or something, the plate has a given temperature, and this temperature serves as a boundary condition for your pot uh, of, of food that you're trying to cook. Okay, or you can have von Neumann boundary conditions. There you specify the spatial derivative of the temperature, for example, here, which would be dt over dx is equal to zero. Von Neumann is usually something saying about the normal derivatives with respect to some direction here, but since we're only in 1D, the normal derivative is just d over dx, of course, okay? And this boundary condition is equivalent of vanishing, vanishing energy flux because you saw the energy flux 
is proportional to the gradient of the temperature. So if the gradient of the temperature vanishes at some boundary, no energy flux goes through this boundary. So this would be an insulating box. Yes, if you have a box which is in completely covered and does not allow any heat flow through the boundaries, this would be the right boundary condition there. Okay, zero flux, zero energy flux through the boundary, rigid walls. Okay, good. And this is also so-called closed or reflective boundary conditions. Okay, these are the two boundary, main boundary conditions you can use. You can also use mixed ones. You see, in a certain part of the boundary, you have directly boundary conditions. You fix the temperature there. And on the upper boundary there, you have the this kind of boundary condition, for example. Let's say if you have a, a pot which you heat from below, you would have below there the directly boundary conditions. If it's freely open at the upper boundary, you would have something like this. Or if you just, let's say, a lid, you put a lid on it here, but heat con can flow through the lid, you would have this boundary condition at the top. Okay. Or you close it completely, you would have uh, then you really insulating lid would have this boundary condition. Otherwise, you have a limited flux there. You can think about different types of conditions here, but you always need to specify the boundary conditions. You see, because these equations here, as you can see, these type of equations, if this uh, now I have to wait. Now you can see it. If this Tj, if J is equal to 1, okay, so this would be the inner boundary. So you need to specify some conditions there, okay. You need to specify boundary conditions and all boundaries here in, this, in the, these equations here, okay. This is important there, and you need to know what you're doing there. Otherwise, your physical solution will be quite different if you choose the wrong boundary conditions here. This is for the advection problem so and more so maybe for the diffusion problems also always look at what the boundaries are doing so in this if j is equal to n at the right hand side then j plus one is the first ghost cell on the right hand side okay i can see that the connection is somewhat a little bit slower maybe so i have to wait until you can see my cursor move Yes, I hope you can nevertheless hear me quite well, uh, but uh, uh, the cursor is not so easy. Okay, so let's step forward here. We have seen this here to calculate the coefficients of your matrix. We have seen how we can write these equations as a system of matrix equation of linear uh, equations here. Okay, that was this one here. And I've shown you how to solve these equations, for example, by forward elimination and backward substitution and we have seen how to implement boundary conditions there okay explicit methods we are now doing the same thing as before we are analyzing we are analyzing so i need to wait um, yes we have the right uh, slide here we are analyzing the stability we are analyzing the stability and we are plugging in as before. This was our equation now. It's unfortunately not numbered. The top one is our equation here. We have for sigma, we have this quantity here. And we expand again in a Fourier series. So we are doing it for Neumann stability analysis again as before, as we have seen before. So this one would be then now here, uh, for example, kx times delta x here here and then we have this expression here and so we would write it like this here and um, we plug this ansatz into these equations here okay so for t j n we plug it in here we plug it in here here we would have n plus one again j minus one and we arrive at this equation here okay just by substituting it straight forward into these previous equation here so we arrive at this one we can now divide again by e i theta j we can divide by this again and we can divide by v n here again from this equation here and we arrive at this equation at the second equation i should maybe number them also again okay so we arrive at this equation here which is given by this we can now substitute for this we can substitute cos theta again okay this one, the e minus i theta plus e plus i theta is just 2 cos theta. We can pull out the 2 here and we arrive at this expression here. We 
and, and we can write then this expression here. And then we can take the absolute modulus here again. And we can see here, this is all uh, real now here. There's no imaginary part anymore here. So we can then see that this one here is smaller than one if sigma is smaller than one half. So the condition is now sigma must be smaller than one half. All right, so you can easily see if you plug in it. So this one can be at maximum, the sign can be one in maximum for all different kinds of thetas here. It says maximum one, so we assume it has the maximum value here, and then you can clearly see if sigma is larger than one half, then we would get values of being larger than one, something like this. Okay, so this, and this gives rise to a stability limit delta t is must be smaller than one half delta x squared divided by k. And we can then introduce again a current factor, fc here, and then we multiply this one here, so fc must be smaller than one. This is just like as it was before, yes, and, and people using here uh, current factors were again one half or something like this, a little bit smaller than this here, okay. Um, what is on my next, next slide? Okay, so you can see here the problem here is that now you have delta x squared written here, okay? Now if you want to double, if you want to double your grid, yes, and make the resolution finer and be more accurate, you double your grid size, uh, your grid, number of grid cells, that means delta x is half as big, if you take delta x squared, it's one quarter. So doubling the grid size here would lead to a, a step, a time step, which is only one quarter, okay? And it becomes worse if you go into multiple directions there, which then the, the uh, problem becomes, let's say you need much more time steps if you want to solve in, let's say, such a problem there. Okay, so that means, because it's quadratic now in your step size, it would be advantageous to get rid of this time step limitation. In addition, in astrophysics, of course, this coefficient k, which is, can be, let's say, the, the viscosity, for example, or it can be something connected to the opacity in astrophysics, can become very large. Okay, and if this is very large, then your time step becomes very, very small, okay? And it become, can become much smaller than your hydrodynamic time scale on which the fluid flows, which is delta x divided by v, by the velocity. So we can, this time step criterion for the, the diffusive part can be very restrictive. And this means that uh, your evolution slows down considerably, yes? Only, only because you're using radiation now. Yeah? So you want radiation, of course, to be more accurate, but this slows down your, your, your computations because you have to evolve everything now on the radiative time scale, and this can be much shorter than the hydrodynamic time scale. Okay? So having this said, it's desirable to have implicit methods here. Okay? We are taking now here the Crank-Nicholson method, if we do yes, the same approach as before, the von Neumann stability analysis, and substitute this Fourier component ansatz into the finite difference equations for the Crank-Nicholson scheme, I have denoted it before, I will number my slides maybe in the future, and then we arrive at this condition here for Crank-Nicholson, and as you can see, this was an, is an implicit method, and it's, there's no time step limitation. This is stable for all values of delta t. This is what I said before. There was a question by one of, your, uh, uh, one of the listeners before, what happens in the implicit methods? Uh, are there, let's say, in general, time step limitations? No, in general, there's no time step limitation on implicit methods. They're always stable for all time steps delta t, okay? The problem is only, as I already noted, is if your physical solution varies on a time scale which is much shorter, or very short, let's say, then it would be no, of no use to take very large 
physical, very large numerical time steps because then you would not resolve this evolution accurately. So you, the evolution needs to be resolved with the appropriate time step and quite often it's, it's smaller, uh, it's, it's, it's the hydrodynamic time step that you would like to solve for, okay. But if this would be limited by radiation then it's good to have an implicit scheme for the radiation so that the hydroevolution is not handicapped by this part here. So some notes on this. This was I think the last part here. Some notes on this. Um, implicit scheme in multi-dimensions lead to large sparse systems or matrix systems, okay, and you need special matrix solvers to solve for those. They are available, there are certain packages here, Linpark or, or, or uh, uh, Petsy library for uh, parallel codes even, and you can uh, get your solutions using these packages. It's very hard to write those solvers by yourself. It's always quite good, good, good exercise to write even uh, uh, one of these schemes yourself but it's more costly, of course. Um, relative diffusion astrophysics needs, this is my recommendation, needs to be solved implicitly straight away. The point is here that all these derivations that I have shown you here uh, for calculating this time step size assume a constant coefficients. Let's say the k, the diffusion coefficient was constant. And, and in the linear advection problem, the velocity was constant. If these quantities like velocity in the advection or the diffusion coefficient in these diffusion problem vary in space, for example, then these stability analyses are not valid anymore, okay? So it's always much better to go straight away with an implicit solver, and particularly for diffusion problems, because otherwise explicit solver may just fail. Yes, and this in principle, this applies also to viscosity. Viscosity, there the viscosity coefficient is a, a, a spatially varying function and the normal instability criteria that you derive by the von Neumann analysis do not really apply. And hence you need in principle an implicit solver, but this can be much more costly for the velocity since it's a vector quantity and your equations are always, where do you see my, my pointer by the way? There we are, there we are, okay. And the equations for the velocity um, are, as I said, much bigger uh, and you have a complex coupled system of equations where you have the velocity components coupled to each other. Okay, and implicit methods are numerically much more costly. I've also said this, uh, and this, but there's a gain, of course. There's a huge gain in doing it implicitly. You avoid all these problems. There was a question at some point ago in last session. Um, if you are not meeting this time strip criterion, uh, yes, you will notice this soon. If you, if you have a too large time step, your uh, solution, your numeric solution will immediately blow up and, and, and grow beyond bounds and this is very easy to see. And <laughs> fortunately, fortunately you can see instabilities very, very soon. Okay, so this was for implicit methods. Uh, for general hydro, implicit method for general hydro is very difficult if not impossible due to their non-linear structure, okay. I um, mean, you can only do a linearization here for these, um, let's say, um, you can only use the, these, these matrix methods here because um, the equations are linear, essentially. The diffusion equation is linear, even though the coefficients may vary in space and time and so on. And nevertheless, the diffusion equation itself is linear in T, yes. Uh, but the advection equation are nonlinear. They are nonlinear cases you cannot do this straight away. There are people having tried, there are some codes available, but my opinion on this is that this is still not really settled and this is not advisable, I think, not even to try it. You should first go with explicit hydrodynamics, okay? So um, how am I doing in time? I think I have 45 minutes done or something, so I could present some examples now and show you some videos if they play correctly here, okay?
Um, yeah, one example is the shock tube. So this is um, one test example in numerical hydro is the standard shock tube, so-called shock tube problem. This is a one-dimensional problem which everybody who does numerical hydro should first do with the code and see how the code that you are actually using behaves. Yes, even though people say, oh, well, yeah, we have done this, this code works fine, it's always very good to, to redo this problem first before you do anything else. This is my very strong recommendation. You do this test problem first. It's a 1D problem, 1D Cartesian problem. If you decide, let's say, to work in a non-Cartesian uh, uh, coordinate system, let's say spherical harmonics or something, then you just go to a region far away from the origin where you are in principle flat, yes, and can do a 1D test problem. If you want to uh, evolve the flow in along the phi direction, then you go also very far away so that the curvature of your problem is small and then you are 1D and so on. So it's, it's always very good. So what is it? What is a shock tube here? You imagine you have a, a, a 1D setup here, and there's a discontinuity at a point x0 here. Um, and at this discontinuity, so there's an initial discontinuity. In, this, in that sense, it resembles our advection problem very nicely here, where at this, at, at this discontinuity, the pressure and the density jump Oh, this is German here. So this is region number two on the left side here and region number one on the right hand side. Okay. So you have high pressure and high density on the left and you have low pressure and low density on the right. And in the middle you have a discontinuity. So it's easily, and the English problem is also easy here. And Bereich means region. Sorry may help you here. So this is region one, region two and there's a jump at x equal naught. Now, if you switch the whole system on, there is waves propagating from the discontinuity. Okay, you have a strong pressure gradient here. That means there's a pressure wave running from left to right, obviously. Okay, yes. And, and this gives rise to a shock wave moving to the right. More details would be given in the chapter waves, which I skipped <laughs> in this lecture here. And, uh, but you can look it up there. So you have different types of waves. Okay, and this is given here. Here's the wave structure of this problem given here. So from the uh, origin here, which is the initial position of the discontinuity, you have wave X4, which is a shock wave. Okay, then you have here, uh, a, on the left side, you have here in region two, you have a so-called rarefaction wave. And here in region, di in region three, you have a density jump, which is a contact discontinuity here. So the, and these, since the states here initially were constant, so you had a constant right-hand side, okay? And you have a constant left-hand side, yes? Constant left-hand side here, these waves travel with a constant speed from the origin, okay? All these velocities are constant in time. That means the solution of such a problem, the analytic solution of such a problem is the same for all times, but it's just stretched in space for later times, okay? Because the waves propagate with constant speed from this initial location of the discontinuity, okay? It's a self-similar problem. The solution remains the same, but it just stretches in space with time, okay? And you can see the solutions for the quantities here, okay? On the right-hand side. On panel number one, on region one here, on the left, you have the original configuration, okay? This is unchanged. On region five on the right, on region five on the right, you also have the original state, which is unchanged, okay? At the position where X4 is, the shock wave, all three quantities, U, P, and rho jump, okay? 
and they, the quantities, the jump conditions can be derived mathematically from certain shock jump conditions here at this position. I will not go into details there. From, let's say, conservation quantities from mass, momentum, energy, you can derive certain jump conditions on it, and they are satisfied here. At this number three here, as you can see, the velocity and the, t and the pressure are constant while the density jumps. This is a so-called contact discontinuity. Only the density jumps, okay? And then in number th in region number three, you can see, region number two, sorry, region number two, you can see that density and pressure just show a continuous drop here to these intermediate values here, and this is called a rarefaction wave, and in this rarefaction wave, the velocity is slowly increasing here, okay, slowly increasing from zero on the left-hand side. The material initially, I didn't say this maybe, at time t equals zero, the material was at rest, so the velocity was zero. Okay, so you t start with the with the configuration where initially uh, all the stuff is at rest, and then you just have two different states. And this can be, uh, let's say, incrementally you can uh, you can um, uh, set this up by taking a pipe, yes, a, a, a whole pipe which is a uh, two meters long. You have a division in this pipe initially. And on the left side, you have the high pressure region. On the right side, you have the low pressure region. And then you just pull out this initial division here, and then you have a shock true problem. Okay. And people have done those experiments then. Okay. And the problem is now that the numerical solution evolves these different types of discontinuities that you have here. Okay. The shock here is one of the big problems where all quantities jump. Then the con contact discontinuity is also important. And you can see the contact discontinuity, if you look at it, you have constant velocity across it. So across the point x3, you have constant velocity and only the density jumps. So this is identical to our advection problem. Okay. So the, con the, the contact discontinuity, the jump in density, is equivalent to our linear advection problem. Yes, U is constant, which we call A, and rho jumps. All the other quantities are constant, so this also needs to be resolved. Okay, how does it look like? There's a standard test for this problem. Yes, you use X is equal in... Um, uh, in, in 0 to 1, so x min is equal to 0, x max is equal to 1, and you have these quantities here, x0, the, the intersection is at 0.5, and gamma is 1.4, and you have these initial conditions here, which I quote in this line here, okay? And um, this setup, exactly this setup, it's called uh, SOD, S-O-D, shock tube. It has been, I think, formulated in the 70s already when people uh, did those simulations here. And this gives you an example of a solution here where I use the Van Leer scheme here, the geometric mean here for our, for our uh, slopes here. And um, then you see uh, this numerical solution in green and the analytical solution in red. After a certain time, you can see this here after a point two to eight uh, uh, in time, and after two hundred twenty-eight time steps, essentially, where one time step is exactly ten to the minus three, and you can see that there's problems in the scheme here. So there's no a little bit too little. Where is my cursor? There's a cursor. There's a little bit too little energy here. The temperature is too low after the shock front. And here you need some, what people call, artificial viscosity and artificial dissipation that will give more a better result with the energy. This is what you can see. You can see here that the contact discontinuity in the top right panel, you can see that the contact discontinuity is spread out a little bit. There's some diffusion here. You can see this. Okay, there's some diffusion. 
And you can see the shock front here is very nicely resolved, but you can also see in the velocity here where the shock front is, and you can see there's some, it's hard to see maybe on the screen here, but if you enlarge it here, you can see here, and let me see if this works here. If I enlarge it, you can see uh, there are some points here too high. So there's some overshooting here. There's some so-called post-shock oscillations here, okay? Um, this is now here, okay, I just need to get to the right size here. <laughs> I'm getting small and large again, okay. So um, this was the solution for the shock tube, okay. Now I give you one or two examples here. I think the organizers will stop me if I, when I talk too long here, eh? okay. I rely on you guys, okay. Um, okay, I will show you some movies here now. Seal of explosion, also a very nice test problem. And some of you guys who like bombs, okay, this is one application, but also supernova outbursts, okay. And this is an example which has been done, uh, solved by Sedov in Russia and Taylor in the United States in the 1950s. You remember there was the Cold War was going on very heavily after the Second World War. People try to find solution, better solutions for having the uh, evolution of spherical uh, 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 shock fronts here. But for the astrophysicists, of course, we do not think about bombs, never. We think about supernovae, okay? What you are doing here is the following. You take a homogeneous distribution of density and energy here in the unit square. My cursor is moving around here, so because it's so slow, <laughs> yes. You take a unit square, this is 2D. This is now 2D, you can also do it in 3D now here. And then you put in, in the center at zero, zero, at the origin, you increase the density to a high value here, and this is, you put in E equals one. So the de energy is very low initially, very low temperature initially, so it's negligible after all. And then, then you just put in an amount of energy in the very center of your domain, okay? And then you solve it in time. And this again gives you the method that I've explained here, which is called Van Leer method. Okay, there's only one difference. Now I solve for the total energy variable, which conserves energy much better. And then I plot the density here, okay? I will try and see if this plays now here. So I click on this here, and I open this. And I hope you can see it running. So we have initially, this is now the density which is showing here, and it's all constant, so that's why it's green. Now we put at the origin, we put energy, and then we have it run. And you can see here, it's a little bit rigged here with the movie playing here, okay. You can see from the origin, there's a spherical shell running outward here, okay. There's a spherical shell moving out, I'm sorry for this, the movie doesn't play so well, you just see a certain limited times here. But you can go to the web page, to my web page, and you see uh, animations as well. Yes? Could you please uh, turn off your uh, webcam, uh, then we might see this animation better. Okay, I will try in doing so. Let okay, thank you. See this briefly? Okay, let me see this here. I need to go out here and, and leave the full screen mode. And now I can see something here. Where am I? Let me see this here. Here I am here. I will turn off my camera here. Okay, great. You don't want to see me anymore. Good. And then I go, uh, let me see. I go here and then I go, where am I? And just a little confusion here. Here we are. So I go back here. And then I go to this one here. Okay. So how is it going now? I'm playing it now. So does it play a little bit better? <laughs> I think okay. it's better. It's a little bit better. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for this uh, hint here. So you can see this here. It's running now. I'm playing it now. It's a little bit better. But as said on the web page, which is linked now, you can see this in the chat also. And um, you can always load down these movies. I think there's not much of a difference here. Okay. I'm playing it now. 
Yeah, you can see, okay, it expands. So the idea is now, uh, and this is solved in Cartesian coordinates, okay, and it's clear that you would like to have the solution also to be spherical. Yes, it looks a little, doesn't look so, it looks a little bit elliptic, but this is just because this, this grid here may be a little bit not quite spherical here. And um, so it should remain spherical on one thing. Then it should have um, follow the shock front also very accurately. And this is shown here in this video here, okay. In this video you can see now the density distribution here. I hope I can see this one a little bit more, a little bit better here. Um, you see the density, so initially, I stop this now here, so you see the density at some time here, okay, and you see in black the analytic solution here, in black the analytic solution, okay, and in blue the numerical solution. So you can see the analytic solution has a strong spike at the shock front, and it's clear that this is of course very difficult to resolve numerically. So you can see here that the analytic solution is in fact much lower here at the shock front here than the, the numerical solution is much lower than the analytic solution here. This is the drawback of course, yeah? but one thing which is good here in this solution here is that the shock speed comes out correctly. So the explosion is followed sort of accurately. Of course you have a drawback here, yes, where it's maximum here, but in general the, the solution is done very accurately. So this, these are two tests here, this uh, set-off explosion and the 1D shock tube problem, yes, that I think is always very important for you guys to do if you want to do real numerical solutions here. So I can see, I mean, now I'm really, uh, really very slow with the slides here. There's a question here. Can we plot these with MATLAB or COMSOL multiphysics? Yes, I don't know. I'm, I'm not using MATLAB myself. You can certainly use MATLAB. This is done with GNU plot or something, some other uh, plot routines that I had, but you can always use this, these packages to plot your results. It's clear, yes. You have to store the data into some arrays here, and then you read in the data, and then you can plot it with any plot routine that you like your favorite plot routine here. Okay, so um, I think I I will just use here some, let's say, two uh, simulations with SPH, as I did not talk about SPH, but Christoph Schäfer, who will talk to you tomorrow, has agreed that he will put some slides on SPH online. And I will show you two simulations that have been done with SPH here, and then I think I will go back to the presentation because this is just too rigged here and I have very great difficulties here for you. You have very great difficulties rather to see it properly. So let me play this video here. So here you see a, um, let me see when this comes up here. Um, bum, bum, bum. Okay, now you can see there's a water is dropping here into a box here. And this box is clear, made of clear walls, here so that you can see what's happening inside. And here you have a, a problem where you have a surface. You see, you have a, a surface of water dropping into this box here. And um, this means you have to uh, concentrate your simulation on the region where there's material. Yes, and that's uh, very difficult to do with the grid in this case, of course, because some parts of the grid would contain regions where there's no gas at all anymore because it's empty. And it's clear that your numerical method, your grid-based methods, do not like to have zero density. So say it clearly, yes, there must always be some density there, otherwise your code will break, okay? But the SPH method does the simulation only there where there are particles. So we can treat the surfaces of this quite nicely, okay? And this is shown in here. The top graph on the uh, on the left here shows you the evolution of different types of energy here uh, from the system here. And this is done by the Technical University of Munich some time ago, and I just draw it, I drew it from the internet here. So, and then we can have just Matthew Bates simulation. I hope one can see this also here. This is what he has done in the question of 
star formation here. So here we take a spherical region of 50 solar masses here, and the units are given here. So it's it's uh, 1.2 light years across 10 Kelvin. So these are conditions which are uh, typical for star forming regions here. And I would just play this video and uh, see whether you can see it and, and, and so on. So I'll just make this bigger now here. This is quite a long video here. So you start out with a sphere here, and uh, you will see in the evolution there on the top, you can see the, the that this is, has this been started? It has not been started even, sorry. So you can see now how it evolves. You can see the time, top right, the spatial evolution, top left here, it will, collapse and go into filaments here. Oh, I see. I think you cannot see it. Or I still see on my second slide here. I don't see anything here. There we go. Okay, it jumps. You see some filaments here. It has collapsed here. And um, it's just running. Sorry, I think the videos do not really behave so nicely here. I think you just have to look it up, yes. You can look it up directly on my webpage or go to the links given in the talk also here. Uh, if you go here on the slide and there's a link to the video directly, which goes to my webpage, and here you can also go to Matthew Bates page, okay? So it's, it's too difficult to play the other videos here I will leave you just with it. It just gives a minimum explanation here, and you can go through them yourself at your convenience here, okay? So, um, yeah, this ends this part of the, oh no, wait, I will just go here, sorry. I will just go here to the end before I miss it. And we'll just go to the last slide here. Let me see how, how far along it takes. So the last slide here. I listed some books here and online lecture notes here. Okay, there's something by Bernd Freitag, uh, who is in uh, Uppsala, I think, Uppsala, Sweden. And he has some online lecture notes, which he gave in some summer school, I guess, or so, where you can hear more about the actual more details about uh, numerical hydrodynamics. Uh, and uh, this would be a very good complement to what I've said here. Then there's the book here. Um, I cannot put you an online link here. I think this would not be allowed here. Okay, so I'm not doing this here, but you, I'm sure you will find a PDF version of this book yourself somewhere on the internet. Numerical Method in Astrophysics, also a very nice book, very nice introduction to the field, as I said, by well-known astrophysicists here, uh, starting from Peter Bodenheimer, Greg Lovely, Michael Roshishka, Tomasz Pleva, and Harold York. Tomasz Pleva was, in fact, one of the developers of the flash code himself, and Harold York did a lot of work in radiation hydrodynamics also. Very nice book. Then you, there's the, the uh, uh, code Pyro code. I think I've never used it myself, but I thought, but just by looking at it, it's, it looks like something very nice, computational astrophysical hydrodynamics. And then if you are interested in, in, in um, the SPH method, there's, I gave you two links here, uh, which is an annual review article by Joe Monahan himself, which I would call, who, whom I would call the master himself. He is one of the inventor of the smooth particle hydrodynamics. And then you have an, a Daniel, uh, Daniel Price's lecture notes on particle smooth particle hydrodynamics there. And there's also online codes available for these methods here. So this would be the summary already. But as you noticed, I skipped one paragraph one section rather, one ch or chapter, I would say. I chipped, skipped chapter three, the waves, and I can come back to this. But first I could take some questions also. Maybe there are some questions at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, if we have uh, any questions, uh, it's a, a good time to just uh, listen to the questions. Thanks. Yes.
Otherwise, if there's no questions, I can give you something on um, on waves. Okay, thank you. There seems to be no question, so uh, the time is yours. Thank you. So shall I take a few more minutes for this? Yeah. Until one o'clock. How long do you go? Yeah, uh, no problem. Yeah, uh, we may go to the waves. Okay, good. So. We are considering now the one-dimensional hydro equations, okay? I'm writing them down here. I can go to full screen mode so you can see them a little bit better now, okay? Full screen mode. And um, motion is in the x-direction, so this would be the one-dimensional hydrodynamics in the x-direction here, okay? And um, here we have on the left hand side the three equations here written in conservative form for the advection part here uh, the cursor is really very slow I'm really sorry for this um, so there's a long time delay you take apart all the spatial derivatives and you arrive on the equation on the right hand side okay and these right hand side equations we can write as a vector equation equation number 62 okay where W is now the vector of unknowns, okay, W is the vector of unknowns, uh, rho U P, and um, A is just a matrix. And you can see this equation 62 is equivalent to the top right set of equations, okay? So we have the three unknowns, rho U P, and A is the matrix here, all right? And these equations is nonlinear and couple, coupled. So what we are trying to do now is a decoupling of the equations. Okay. And a decoupling means that we are trying to diagonalize the matrix A. Okay. If we have diagonalized the matrix A, we have three independent equations and we can look at their structure. Okay. This is no background information. It is not directly used for, for solving the problem. It will be very useful for Riemann solvers, for example. It's more useful for this. So how does it work? Okay. To diagonalize the matrix, we need to find the eigenvalues of the determinant, the eigenvalues of the matrix here. And that means uh, we need to find the three eigenvalue, eigenvalues here. We have a three-dimensional mat matrix here. And the eigenvalues, as you may remember from your classes on linear analysis, can be calculated by taking the determinant and substit uh, 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 um, uh, substituting, no, no, uh, um, subtracting from this lambda times the unity metric matrix here. And this is done here. So the eigenvalues, the three eigenvalues are calculated from the determinant of this expression here. And as you know, you can do this. We can go here and, and expand the, the um, eigenvalues here by looking first at this one here, and then we get this expression here. So we expand it according to the first column here because there's two zeros here, okay? So we can say we have this expression now for the eigenvalues here. And calculating this, we find three eigenvalues, which we denote by lambda zero, which is just the velocity. Okay, this first factor in equation 64 gives us the first eigenvalue, and the other two eigenvalues are given by the square bracket in equation 64, which is u plus minus cs and u. Okay, and, we, and these, it, as you can see, the eigenvalues have all the dimensions of velocities, okay? Those, so they describe some transport properties of these equations, okay? So the eigenvalues are the three characteristic velocities in the problem, which is the fluid velocity and which is the fluid and the sound velocity here. So information can propagate physically only with the speed of the flow itself, which would be the fluid velocity, lambda zero, or and or we can have sound waves which can propagate with the fluid velocity plus and minus the sound speed. So if the sound speed and the fluid velocity are in the same direction, we have an additional faster velocity and they can be subtracted and then we have a slower velocity here. 
Okay, so we have three three real eigenvalues, and knowing from mathematics, we know if the eigenvalues are all real, we can diagonalize the matrix by multiplying it with suitable transformation matrix Q that is built up from the eigenvalues. So this is essentially a, a summary, yes, you need to know something about linear algebra here to fully comprehend it. But if you have done something like quantum mechanics or so, I think you should know this. Otherwise, you just look it up, okay? So we can, we have three eigenvalues here, which we denote now by zero, plus, and minus, okay? Not by one, two, three, but just to make it more clear that we have a distinction here between these eigenvalues here. And then we can, this lambda, this matrix lambda here, is then a diagonal matrix which contains the eigenvalues on the diagonal as okay you know this i've written it down here okay and then you can have here explicitly i wrote it down for you if you want to go through the equations here i wrote you the transformation matrix here and then we have here we had this equation here before okay equation 68 we had before where W was a vector and A was first the transport matrix here. And now we can have had this, these transformations uh, from A to lambda, the diagonalization procedure here. And if we define a new vector V such that by uh, dV is equal Q minus one dW, then we can plug this in here, this equation 69, we can plug into equation 68 using this relation in the middle, and we arrive at equation 70. 70 is entirely equivalent to our hydrodynamic equations, but it has, as the transport matrix here, only diagonals. So these are three decoupled equations, okay? And V0, V plus, V minus are just the characteristic variables, and they are constant on curves, it should read here, not in curves, constant on curves dx over dt equals zero, equals lambda j, which can be seen from this equation here, okay? So from the definitions we had here, so um, if you go uh, look at, sorry, if I just need to jump back here. So we had these definitions here, dw on the left side of equation 69, we can look at Q minus one, okay? And we know W also, W were just the physical variables, U, rho, and P, we can calculate dV. So the definition of these quantities Vs are not explicit, but they're implicitly through the differentials, okay? Through the differentials, this needs to be kept in mind. And then we arrive at the following quantity, so we can see dV has this quantity here, and the question then arises here, what is dV? And there we use the first law of thermodynamics. And we can see, to make a long story short here, we just look at the bottom equation 20, uh, 76 here, we can see that V is equivalent to the entropy S, okay? The entropy S has here, as an evolution equation here, the S over the T is equal to zero. It is transported along streamlines, and uh, which is in 70, equation 75 and 76. So we can see the equation 75 is the equation for the entropy from the first law of thermodynamics, which is equivalent to equation 72, just identifying, let's say, lambda zero was U anyhow. So we see that V zero is just the entropy. The entropy is just affected with the flow. It corresponds to the first eigenvalue of our equations, lambda zero, okay? The other two speeds denote, give rise to other two variables, V plus and V minus, which are so-called Riemann invariants, okay? And you can see the definition of these Riemann invariants following from the definition of dV plus minus in equation 78. So they are given in the integral form of integral over dP over, uh, dP over Cs. And if you plug in, let's say, uh, the adiabatic condition here, you can find 
that these are fulfilled for the two Riemann invariants 80, and they are constant on curves dx over dt is equal u plus minus cs. Okay, so we can see that in hydrodynamics, there's three waves emanating from any points with three different velocities, u and u plus minus cs. And along these curves, there's three quantities left constant, the entropy s and these velocity f, v plus and v minus, okay? Good. And these can be used, by the way, these can be used to calculate a code which transports, let's say, these Riemann invariants on these curves from these variables, u, s and, and v plus minus, and then both those quantities on curves and then calculates back the physical variables. So these are sometimes called primitive variables. Okay, steepening of sound waves. We have seen here that the linear advection equation gave rise to an equation here, to a wave equation, but we can also see this in the Euler equation that we get a wave equation for certain quantities, for the density, for example, if we have only very, very sh the small disturbances, okay? And this is shown here in equation 81. This would be the wave equation for disturbance rho 1. And the disturbances evolve with the sound speed, the sound speed here. Cs squared is a gamma p over rho. Okay, and then, then here, the diagram here shows you the evolution of some wave here, which is given here as a disturbance here in P with an amplitude delta P here in time. And now you can see here this disturbance in pressure, and let's say at a maximum of the pressure, the, the sound speed is higher. So the pressure maximum has a higher sound speed, while the pressure minimum has a lower sound speed. That means any profile that we have initially, any difference in pressure that we have at some point will steepen. Because higher pressure regions move faster than lower pressure regions, and so this profile will steepen and will develop in a discontinuity. This is true for all disturbances, okay? And this is the problem for hydrodynamics. If you have no dissipation in the system, either numerically or real, all waves that you have, all sound waves, will, if the sound speed is higher for increased density as it typically is, or increased pressure in this case, they will steepen and become shock waves. So a shock wave is the structure you have here, which is the actual discontinuity in the structure. Okay, there was an example I found somewhere here of a receding shock wave, you see, in, in I don't know whether how much skiing you have done in, in, in your life so far, but some people here in Germany go into the Alps and they do some skiing there, and sometimes there are some, let's say, boundaries, let's say, in on the slope here, just like trees, for example. You see, they have sometimes trees on the slope. And then people hitting here the tree, and it's clear they come here with very high velocity, supersonic velocity, and suddenly the velocity is reduced to essentially zero, and this is a sort of receding shock wave, as I try to joke here. And this is like a standing accretion shock in front of a protostar, on the top of a protostar, for example. The matter is flowing onto the star here, just like the skiers here, and then it's accreted here. You have a standing shock front here, and matter is slowly accreted uh, inside, close to the, uh, the star, and coming with very high speed from the other parts. And this closes this wonderful section about waves. So this was just a little background for you guys, what type of structures uh, is possible in the evolution of the hydrodynamic equations.
Okay, with that, I think I can go out of the full screen mode of the presentation and I can switch on my video again so that you can see me in the last one or two minutes. And this closes essentially my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, let's all applause our speaker, Professor uh, Willy Kly. Uh, if you have any question, uh, I think we have a few minutes for um, one or two questions. Thanks. Okay. You can see me infinitely many times, maybe. <laughs> So everything crystal clear. Uh, was in did you receive any questions? I did not receive. Well, uh, I don't. I just see some uh, thanks and some yeah, that's, that's also fine, fine with me. <laughs> some, uh, some people are writing Dankeschön, so. <laughs> Okay, very good session. <laughs> so, if uh, uh, anybody has any question, we, uh, has a question. We, okay, okay. Uh, Mohammed has a question. Uh, Mohammed, please go on. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Vidi, for your for your uh, interesting presentation. Just as a, a very tough question, does it important for uh, simulating, for example, wave in uh, our course? Uh, the the method is it in, is it important to uh, for example use um, grid method or SPH method or moving mesh method for simulation of uh, waves is it important? Um, it what type of method you're using uh, for solving your problem depends a lot on your problem. Okay. There is no, I think there is no unique way of saying, okay, you need to use that or that method, yes. Uh, and in our group, in my group here, people using different type of methods for attacking different types of problems, okay. Sometimes a fixed grid method may be fine to use, okay. Sometimes you would like to have a moving mesh method, for example, imagine stellar oscillations, the star oscillates, yes. And if you were to do this with the grid, you would like to have the grid moving with the oscillations of the star, for example. And, and other, in other problems, you would like to have an SPH method, for example, in galaxy evolution, evolutions of the universe, where we have lots of voids and empty space, then uh, let's say an SPH solution may be the best uh, to do. So it depends a lot on your problem. I think there is no general recipe of what code is best. Uh, the problem, let's say, in moving mesh, there's also moving mesh codes now available, like Arepo and other codes, they can also be very useful in, in certain instances here. But there's not maybe one code which can solve you all the problems. That's what people would like to have. Typically, maybe that there's sometimes a code better suited for that problem, sometimes a code better suited for another problem also. Yeah. This is very general answer to your question, but it was a very general question, I think. Also. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. There is also a question in the chat. Really, thanks a lot before. Uh, there is a question about the Coron factor. Yeah. Uh, the question is that if we have a group of equations, including the diffusion equation, and if we have a Coron factor for the diffusion equation, is that enough for all of them? Yes, I mean, you take usually the smallest current factor of all your different parts in the equations. Yes, and that will can be used. You can also use, let's say, you can also do the following. Let's say if you have a, a current factor which is, or a time step rather, I should say, a time step which is much shorter in the diffusion part, you could do 10 diffusion parts and then only one hydro part. Okay, so you would not slow down the whole evolution you would evolve the diffusion part of it with a small time step to, as I said, for example, 10 small time steps with the diffusion 
part and then only one hydro time step. This can be done uh, of speeding up the simulation. So you don't have to use the small time step for the whole code, but can pick out certain other things, okay? This was probably clear here, I see, okay. Okay. There are uh, answer this. Okay. Raise some examples in Astrofix that the solution to waves is important. Okay. I think we had this question. Yeah, was it? Solution to waves. I mean, it depends also if you have, let's say, shock waves, for example, in, in, in supernova outbursts and you would like to evolve a supernova outburst and um, f follow exactly the, the uh, heating front, I mean, the burning front, for example, then it's very, very important to resolve this structure accurately. If you have a problem which is very smooth and is dominated by viscosity, for example, like in accretion disks or something, in accretion disks, it may be, it's also impossible to resolve some waves, but not, let's say, in a different type of accuracy than you have for example, in supernova outbursts. So the, the problem also may require, let's say, different uh, methodologies here. Wave evolution is very important. In inviscid flows where you have not viscosity that can smear out things, then it's, it's much more important than in, in strongly viscous flows. Okay. So having that said, I don't know if there's some other okay. things we can uh, add here. I have any other question? So, uh, is there any other question? No. Okay. Uh, let's thank thank again our speaker. And uh, tomorrow we'll be having a uh, taste of Schaefer and, uh, and the next day uh, uh, we'll have Professor Hanover here. So. Yep. Uh, our program is to start tomorrow at 11.30 Iran local time and uh, 9 o'clock Germany, uh, mm -hmm. 12.30 Indian local time. Thanks again and yep. thank, thank, you. thank you to you guys for listening, asking questions and all the best greetings to you in Iran, okay? Thanks. Bye-bye. Sorry, bye-bye to you. Okay, see you the next time, sorry. Okay. Bye-bye.